Members, it is now time for questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. And I call Doug Beattie. Question one, Mr Speaker. As you may be aware, customs formalities are not a devolved issue, um, though my department has been liaising with HMRC in order to seek clarity on these issues. The HMRC advice states that for fish caught in the UK territorial waters, the EU's view is that there is need for customs and regulatory requirements, including the submission of safety and security declarations by the fishers on each landing. This potentially means that there is the need for additional control for the landing of goods, that is fish, at Northern Ireland's fishing ports, which would be extremely burdensome and totally unworkable for most of the smaller vessels, as some of these requirements mean they have to land in a port under customs control, which may be a considerable distance from their home port. The UK D has provided us with a different legal interpretation on these customs formalities, and have advised that Northern Ireland vessels will only be required to meet pre-existing obligations, such as those contained within the Fisheries Control Regulation when landing into ports in Northern Ireland until further notice. This is in line with the approach taken to the implementation of the protocol more broadly, where there is the need for pragmatism as traders and fishers adapt to new requirements. The UKG have assured me that they would robustly defend this approach should any challenge to it be raised by the European Union, though it is important to note that this has been the subject of engagement between the UK and EU during the course of joint committee proceedings. It is accepted that this approach will require further discussions with the EU. However, the UK's position is clear that Northern Ireland vessels should not be subject to any new customs requirement until further notice. However, my department has been working through a number of Ireland Northern Ireland protocol issues in the recent UK EU negotiations that relate to fish being landed in Northern Ireland ports by NI registered vessels, two of which have been successfully resolved through these negotiations. The outstanding unresolved issues relate to illegal, unreported and unregulated regulations, and this issue on the application of the EU customs formalities on the fish landed by our vessels into our reports. I have been pressing the UKG in these matters since early last year, the time where I have made it clear that my desire was to have a carve-out of these obligations <coughs> similar to what was provided in the SPS and tariff issues through the negotiations. And can I remind the Minister that there is two minutes, and if he requires additional money, time, he can, he can request an additional minute. I call Doug Beatty for supplementary. Minister, thank you for, for that uh, very fulsome uh, answer, and I absolutely appreciate that. This is something outside of your control, and I know uh, that you're working hard on this, but you will agree with me that it is absolutely uh, ridiculous that water around Northern Ireland can be classed as a third country um, for our fishermen to go into. It's one of those ludicrous uh, aspects of the protocol. But slightly on a side issue, Minister, can I just ask you, and, and to, this is a spin-off slightly to that, um, what influence can you have to make sure that Northern Ireland fishermen get their, their, their full quota from the new quotas um, system in regards to the, the extra fishing quotas for post-Brexit? In relation to that, um, obviously I, I was not happy with, with uh, the deal that was initially uh, arranged by uh, the Prime Minister and the European Union, and that I believed that we should have obtained uh, much greater uh, volumes of quota than, than would, should have been the case um, under Brexit, uh, but that the UK government settled for something less than that, although we will be revisiting that um, in, tw in 2025. However, in terms of uh, the quota as it was awarded, um, we had extensive uh, discussions uh, and correspondence um, with UKG on this matter. Um, they have arrived at the circumstance that they have arrived. Uh, which did not give us the uplift that we would have wanted, albeit um, we have on average a 10 per cent uplift across the fleet. So in that respect, um, the fishermen are considerably better after Brexit, but it could have been much better than that again um, had a tougher deal been negotiated with the European Union um, by the UK Government. I call Martina Anderson. Me, I'll get the last can call you. Um, Minister, given the devastating impact of Brexit on uh, fishing men and women, what exactly is the current position for fishing vessels that are going from the north 
to the south and vice versa? Well, first of all, I don't accept that it's a devastating impact for fishermen as a result of Brexit. As I indicated, they will be able to catch more fish. And uh, were it not for the COVID situation, um, then the value of those fish would be considerably higher than is the current situation. As the members probably aware, there was an agreement uh, between ourselves and the Irish Republic, the, the Vosnage Agreement. Uh, and under the Fisheries Act 2020, um, all EU vessels fishing in UK waters must be licensed by the UK. Similarly, UK vessels fishing in the UK, EU waters must be licensed by EU. And the reciprocal access uh, to the Ireland and Northern Ireland not the six uh, nautical mile zone under the existing Voyage Neighbourhood Agreement means that we must license each other's vessels. And this is something that has been uh, progressed urgently. Vessel lists have been exchanged and we are waiting on confirmation that licences will be issued to Northern Ireland vessels before we can respond. But we are very keen uh, to ensure that Northern Ireland fishermen can continue to fish in Irish waters um, and that Irish fishermen um, can continue to fish in the UK waters um, under the previous agreement. It worked extremely well. And uh, if there's any hold back in that, it's not coming from the Northern Ireland side. I call Justin McNulty. Thank you, Minister, for your answers thus far. Minister, what's your assessment of the additional quota allocated to the local fishing industry as an outcome of Brexit? Um, be better than it was before Brexit, but not as good as it could have been had a tougher negotiation uh, been uh, adhered to um, by the UK uh, in terms of regaining um, the waters uh, that we have been deprived of for many years. So the opportunities um, that exist are not what they could be, um, but I would hope that we will take the opportunities that exist now uh, and that uh, in the future negotiation uh, we will gain considerably more uh, opportunities um, for our fishermen. Moving on, I call Gemma Dolan. Garmail, get last can call you. Question two. In 2018, DERA undertook an engagement exercise, gathering a broad range of stakeholder views on future agricultural policy. Those views and future stakeholder engagement have been central in developing my vision for future agriculture in Northern Ireland. My department is now at an advanced stage in the development of a draft policy framework portfolio, which I hope to publish in coming months. The framework has been defined around the four key outcomes of increased productivity, improved resilience, environmental sustainability and improved supply chain functionality. We will continue to engage with our farmers and land managers and our environmental stakeholders to co-design new agriculture policies as this work continues into the years ahead. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, can I ask you to outline your intentions regarding the issue of entitlements? Um, is this a policy that you will continue into the development of a future agricultural policy? Well, I, I want to uh, engage with industry and indeed uh, with the Assembly and, and the Assembly Committee on, on these issues before I arrive at any fixed positions. What I do think is that we should have a fit for purpose um, agricultural payment policy. It is something which we need to reflect on in terms of the whole climate change um, policy as well, and ensuring that uh, those farmers who may have to lose some of their, 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 their um, land which have been available for grazing because we wet peatlands, etc., um, are adequately compensated for that. Um, we need to look at um, the support that is provided for uh, hill farmers in particular um, to keep suckler cows and, and sheep and, and ensure that those hills are, are well utilised. Um, we need to consider um, whether uh, we want to support suckler cows in lowlands or whether, because of sex semen, uh, for example, that uh, the beef would be coming from the dairy herd uh, and therefore there isn't a requirement. Um, that, that we would be wanting to incentivise farmers to keep sucklers on, on lowland. The, but these are all issues for discussion and for debate. I don't have fixed positions on them at this moment in time um, because I think it would be wrong to do that uh, before uh, we identify uh, what the, the public's views are and indeed what the, this Assembly's views are. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Minister, have you, 
has, have you determined a change in the departmental policy on the final decision making of the DERA appeals process yet? Well, it, it, it would appear that legally um, it, it ends with the Minister, um, but I have made it very clear that this Minister um, has no intention of overturning um, the views uh, that have been expressed by an independent panel. Unfortunately, um, that was not the case um, for many, many years, and um, quite a number of, of, of appeal cases that went to the independent panel uh, were overturned. That is something that I disagree with. Uh, there is no point in having an independent panel and then the Minister um, being lobbied by officials uh, and overturning the views of the independent panel. Um, in my view, um, it is a much fairer process. If someone goes to an independent panel, they make their case, they make their arguments, it is accepted there um, that the Minister would accept um, the case that has been provided by that panel. I call John Blair. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister if future agricultural policy will involve significant further investment in sustainable farming systems, as these would be key uh, to not just a COVID recovery but also a green recovery? Um, yes, absolutely. And I have asked my officials to work up a bid um, to the Department of Finance, because if we are serious about climate change, uh, we need to recognise that it is going to involve significant investment. And uh, we will be seeking the Department of Finance to support us in making that significant investment um, and supporting the farming community in particular to make that investment, uh, where they can do uh, engage uh, in activities which will significant, significantly reduce uh, the carbon footprint, um, which will engage in carbon capture. And that is a course of work that, that is absolutely critical um, that we work across the executive all. I call Pat Singlone. Thanks very much, and thanks very much to the minister for his answers. Uh, just uh, there have been a number of threads that we've been working through there, and the responses to that. Can the minister confirm the? Uh, will there be a specific bill tailored for Northern Ireland? He mentioned a number of policy areas that were to be looked at. Will there be a specific bill for for that purpose? Uh, be, be a decision for the new minister um, or the next minister, whoever that happens to be uh, after the election. I do not think that we will be um, time-wise capable of introducing an agricultural bill in, in the lifetime of this Assembly, which is run, running to May 2021, or 2022. Rather. Moving on, I call George Robinson. Question 3, Mr Deputy Speaker. My officials have confirmed there is no further update at this time following the information provided pursuant to AQW 1099-17. 22, and your Freedom of Information Request DERA 20 334 received on 12 December. My officials have confirmed again that the project in question relating to the reinstatement of the hydroelectric scheme at the Roe Valley Country Park cannot be completed until such time as permission is granted by an adjacent landowner for access onto their lands in order to allow works to proceed. As previously advised, Department officials have confirmed a comprehensive proposal has already been made to this adjacent landowner through their legal representatives, and whilst officials have been notified that the landowner in question considered this proposal unacceptable, departmental officials are still awaiting specific details as to what elements of the existing proposal they are objecting to. The landowner concerned is aware of this. To date, no further contact has been received by officials from the landowner in question or indeed an appointed legal representative as regards these details. I call George Robinson for supplementary. Thank, thank the Minister for his, his answer. Minister, I fully appreciate that there is a long running difficulty with this project, which has caused the, the adjacent landowner great distress and physically and mentally since 2013, and according to Freedom of Information, which the, the landowner has sought so far, has cost the taxpayer quite a lot of money. Minister, could you undertake to see if a speedy resolution could be found to bring this worthy project to a conclusion in the interest of everyone? And could I ask uh, if a site meeting or an online meeting with department officials, landowner, yourself and I, would be accept acceptable? 
Um, on the latter part, uh, I can't give you a specific answer because obviously this has been dealt with through the Departmental Solicitor's Office, and the landowner has their own um, legal advisers. So I'm not I'm not unwilling to do it, um, but we, we will we will advise advice on it. I recognise that it is a project um, which is very worthy uh, and one which we want to take forward, um, but we need the cooperation of the landowner. And if the landowner have issues, then we need to identify what those issues are and see if we can uh, reach agreement um, with the individual. I call Mark Durkin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. The intrinsic value of our country parks, open spaces, and forests has been amplified over this past year. Will the Minister commit his department to continuing work? with uh, Derry City and Straban District Council to facilitate the repair or reinstatement of the footbridge in Muff Glen Forest uh, just outside Eglinton that was destroyed by floods in 2017, making this tremendous asset more accessible and increasing the number of people who can enjoy it. I believe that's beyond the Rue Valley, but the Minister may wish to respond. Uh, I am unaware of the particulars of the case. Um, I was not forewarned of it, but uh, in any event, um, we have been working closely with councils across Northern Ireland to improve um, our forest parks, and, and we have seen some, some fantastic projects um, carried forward where DERA has supported um, uh, local authorities, and it has really improved access uh, both for uh, families and disabled. And we're happy to look at uh, the issue that has been raised by the member around Muffley. Moving on, I call John Stewart. I received a portfolio of documents in the Island McGee gas storage proposals. My department is a competent authority on the marine licence, and I am also considering a review documentation for the two other DERA licences that were issued back in 2014, a water discharge consent and a water abstraction licence. The documentation is comprehensive and will therefore take some time um, to be considered fully. Call John Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response on that. The Minister will be aware that the Gas Caverns project has been and remains very contentious, particularly on Island McGee. I would be interested to get more detail of the advice he has received, both on the full marine licence and review and the abstract licence and consent to discharge. Um, is he minded, um, on the back of legal advice, to refer this to the Executive Committee, and will he support calls to inst instigate a local public inquiry? Well, in respect of this, I have only received the documents. Um, and therefore, <clears throat> I will be giving them full consideration before making a decision. I recognise that the proposed development is unpopular uh, with some of the local residents, and uh, that uh, in itself does not mean that it is controversial in terms of legislation around executive referral. Um, so, uh, whilst it may be controversial locally uh, in terms of the, the measures for a minister to have to take it to the executive. It does not necessarily mean uh, that it is controversial, um, but I can assure you that I am considering the op option of executive referral, and I am also mindful of my duties under the ministerial code and, uh, uh, in terms of the option of holding a public inquiry. Um, as you can appreciate, I am unable to comment further at this stage until I have that full consideration taken. I call Stuart Dixon. Minister, and thank you for the answer which you have given to my colleague from East Antrim. Um, would the Minister agree with me that a public inquiry is inevitable, given the uh, outcry that there has been in respect of this particular project, and that indeed it is a cross-cutting matter for the Executive and not one solely for his department? Well, in terms of it, um, we have our scientists who have been working on this and, and identifying the issues and um, you know, public inquiries will be called on the basis of, of facts, not noise. And whilst I sincerely appreciate um, the concerns of residents, it's a very pleasant area, uh, a beautiful area, right out to Browns Bay. There, um, it's one I go to on occasions, uh, and I appreciate uh, the, the, the beauty of that area. And therefore. Um, the local residents will want to keep it um, uh, 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 as, as it is, and therefore all of these things have to be given the full appropriate consideration. I, I, I will probably um, be in a situation where, where this has a huge potential to be judicially reviewed 
by either the applicant or indeed the residents, whichever decision I make. Um, so therefore, I have to be very careful what I say, uh, and I have to give this my absolute careful consideration uh, before arriving at a decision. But we do have papers, and progress is being made in terms of arriving at a decision, and uh, that is something for, for, for us to work on at this stage. I call Kiva Archibald. Last can call you, and I thank the Minister for his response. Does the Minister agree, in light of his own recently published proposals for the Climate Change Act and also the Green Growth Framework, that it is inappropriate to proceed with further investment in fossil fuels rather than focusing on meeting our renewable targets? It certainly is a consideration. Um, energy is, uh, lies within the Department for Enterprise, our Department for the Economy. And um, we have been uh, looking to receive advice from them uh, on what their future uh, expectations is. Um, gas is, is a clean energy, but it is still a fossil fuel. Um, but it certainly has a much lower impact um, than uh, coal or oil. And consequently, if it is identified that gas will be used um, for a considerable part of the foreseeable future, um, then that uh, would lead you to a point where the gas caverns are uh, something which would be beneficial um, from the, the energy point of view, um, not necessarily from the environmental point of view. Um, however, if the, the energy uh, is pointing to um, providing uh, the, the energy resource from, from other means, um, as opposed to gas, um, and a significant upgrade in renewable energy, then that would take you away from um, the gas caverns. I should say that uh, the Department for Economy has set 70 per cent uh, for renewable energy by 2030. Um, going beyond that, we would need to be developing um, widespread, um, large-scale offshore um, electricity generation, which takes about 10 years to plan. Uh, so that, that, that is an issue which will in itself have its own controversies. Um, so whatever you do in all of these areas, there is a, going to be a degree of controversy, uh, and we need to respond to it. I should have advised members earlier that question seven has been withdrawn. I now call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question five. There is an increasing acceptance that the Northern Ireland agri-food industry requires a more assured supply of veterinarians than is available from the existing sources. However, there are a number of possible options for meeting this need. In my absence in early March, Minister Gordon Lyons met with the Vice Chancellors of the University of Ulster and Queen's University Belfast. Minister Lyons proposed an analysis of the options for the supply of veterinarians and a more detailed consideration of the various delivery models, structures and locations to inform a business case for the, <coughs> for the facility for veterinary education in Northern Ireland. It was agreed with the two University Vice Chancellors that the Strategic Investment Board would be asked to carry this out as soon as possible. The Strategic Investment Board is now commissioned to undertake this analysis, which will go forward with input from staff from the two universities and the support of the DERA officials over the next six to nine months. I call Morris Bradley for supplement. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. The uh, Minister has been highlighted, as you have rightly mentioned, there in recent developments, the shortage of vets across Northern Ireland. Uh, can I ask the Minister if his department could bring a brief outlining the progress of the DIRA, to the DERA committee, committee as soon as possible? It is something that I have raised both in committee and in the House, and I would be keen to see progress. Um, the Department would be happy to update the DERA committee and indeed the member um, as we go along here. Um, obviously, we have commissioned this work um, from the Strategic Investment Board. Um, I would like to see that work completed um, as quickly as possible. Uh, and identify a way forward on it. Clearly, um, we have a, a shortage of veterinarians, and as a consequence of that, um, veterinarians come from other countries to Northern Ireland to help uh, sustain uh, our, our agri-food sector. Our agri-food sector is worth some £5 billion to our economy, and therefore it is criti critically important um, that we achieve that. But it will be much better circumstance uh, to be able to ensure that we have the appropriate veterinarians uh, educated here in Northern Ireland, um, and we will have less uh, leaking of those uh, young people who, who take up that course um, and do it um, in uh, mainland Great Britain, in Europe, uh, and indeed 
uh, in the Irish Republic. I call Philip McGuigan. Uh, last one, Collier. Uh, and the Minister in his answer uh, alluded to the fact that we have a shortage of vets here in the north. Over and above that, uh, perhaps the Minister could outline for us the benefit of a veterinary school here for animal health and welfare and on the agri-food sector. Well, we have an excellent uh, research um, facility here in Northern Ireland through AFBE uh, and indeed other sources. And we have um, so, so, so some large uh, pharmaceuticals in the agri-food sector as well. So we, we are a country which is moving forward on all of these things. So therefore, the tie-up between a, a university which is specialising in veterinarian uh, course uh, with both agri-food um, and with uh, the pharmaceutical sector for agri-food um, would be hugely beneficial in terms of research, uh, in terms of encouraging young people to take up the veterinary course, um, having it available locally um, would be hugely beneficial. It is an expensive course, um, and therefore um, universities uh, have to take all of those things into account in bringing it forward. But nonetheless, I think it would be hugely beneficial uh, for Northern Ireland, as well as the universities, um, whatever university or collaboration of them, uh, take the opportunity up. I call Steve Aiken. And May I thank the Minister for his uh, uh, answers so far. As the Northern Ireland Protocol, and particularly the TCA, where it comes to the recognition of qualifications, has that increased any pressure on the availability of veterinary services and vets here in Northern Ireland? Well, the protocol has certainly uh, placed pressure because we are requiring, uh, if, if things do not change, um, around 600 officials at, at ports um, between uh, DERA and the local councils. And we would be looking um, close to 200 vets. Um, and they just do not exist. You don't train vets in, in six months. You train vets over five years. Um, so the vets don't exist for, for that job. Uh, and the problem is that if we draw vets off other services, um, are we damaging on animal welfare? Um, are we taking vets away from veterinary practices um, who, who are, are out on farms or, or who are engaged in small practice and all of that? So, you know, we're, we're left in this ridiculous position where vets will be checking food, um, which came here for years uh, without checks, and is going to be consumed in Northern Ireland, um, and they're not available um, to actually do things which are required for animal welfare. So it does certainly have a very significant impact. Moving on, and I call Cahill Boyle. The last one, Carly. Kester Roche, question number six, please. There has been significant stakeholder engagement and consultation in developing the draft rural policy framework to date. In light of the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact that it has had across rural areas, we have been receiving, reviewing the draft of the rural policy framework document to ensure that it is reflective of the ever-changing context before going to public consultation. It has always been the intention that the rural policy framework will be a living document that is intended to be flexible and adaptable to change. So, subject to securing the necessary approvals, I hope to launch a public consultation later this spring. It is anticipated that the rural policy framework proposals will be available for an eight-week online consultation period. Officials continue to deliver a range of schemes to support rural communities and the businesses with just over £20 million invested in rural development programmes in the financial year just finished. I call Calvin Boylan for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister will be aware that the Community Renewal Fund, launched by the British Government as a main plank to the Shared Prosperity Fund, can the Minister get, provide any information on that scheme on whether or not there will be a consultation in relation to trying to protect and give uh, rural communities opportunities to access that scheme? I would certainly hope um, that there will be uh, the opportunity. Uh, to, to, for, for consultation on the Shared Prosperity Scheme. Obviously, that is a scheme which has been delivered uh, directly from the Westminster Government. Um, unlike others, I, I, don't, I don't complain about it because it's additional money for Northern Ireland, ultimately. And it's additional money for the people that we represent uh, in this House. And uh, just because it's not us distributing it uh, is not something that I'll decry. I didn't decry the EU money uh, whenever it was coming. And this uh, money, which will be uh, very much replacing uh, some of the structural funds, 
etc., that, that came from the European Union is something that I would welcome and will seek to influence as best I can uh, for the benefit of, of, of my constituents. And that is the end of our period of time for listed questions, and we now move on for 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Gemma Dolan. Can the Minister confirm if he consulted any environmental experts other than the Climate Change Committee when developing his proposals for a climate change bill? Well, the Climate Change Committee is the expert independent panel um, set up by the UK Government. And um, they have appointed independent experts to give that advice. So our, our department works very closely um, with all of the bodies um, that are involved, all of the NGOs uh, that are involved um, in environmental issues. Uh, we support them significant, with significant uh, financial support, and we uh, listen to what they have to say and engage with them um, on the issues. So I would uh, suggest that the evidence that the department has taken is much greater than the evidence of those behind the private members' bill, and I would wish um, those members who are supportive of it to indicate to me and to the general public in Northern Ireland what independent evidence they want to bring to the table, because saying that Scotland is doing it by 2045 is not evidence. That is an indication of what another country can achieve. And by the way, the Climate Change Committee are supportive of that and are recommending that, um, whilst they are recommending something different from Northern Ireland. So I would be very interested in evidence, and I, I await the members' uh, evidence coming forward. I call Gemma Dolan for a supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, the Minister's proposals do not actually commit us to net zero by 2050. There is a wealth of expert advice that says the North is capable of reaching true net zero by 2050 without unfairly affecting specific sectors, such as agriculture. Given the severity of the climate crisis, does the Minister think it is appropriate that we do the legally required minimum when more ambitious alternatives exist? I, I do not believe uh, it is appropriate that we do the minimum. I, be, I believe it is appropriate that we do the maximum. And <clears throat> If the member has evidence, and I, I note she says there is a wealth of it, so, so I look forward to hearing the evidence, as opposed to uh, pontificating that it exists, but not actually producing it. And I call Rosemary Barton. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Minister, while I understand there is a mitigation in place at the present time regarding the vaccination of pets up to the 30th of June, Great Britain, as you know, is now opening up opening up again to receiving visitors, tourists, etc. And of course, holiday time is coming. Can you advise if this mitigation will be extended into July and August for people from Northern Ireland wishing to go there on holiday and then returning with their pets from GB into Northern Ireland? Thank you. I thank the member for the question. And I do welcome the fact that the mitigation um, was introduced in January um, and gave us that six months. Um, I, I wasn't looking for that six months um, to allow us time to prepare, although some people will. Um, I was looking at six months to negotiate away this nonsense um, where pets have to be uh, treated um, for conditions that, that don't exist in either the United Kingdom or the Republic of Ireland. So the British Isles is free of these diseases, and therefore we are imposing upon pets and upon, uh, upon animals something which is unrequired, um, a, 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 a medicinal practice, uh, what, which, which they do not need. And I think that we have to resist it um, as firmly and as strongly as possible. That is what I am engaged in doing. I call Rosemary Barton for supplementary. Thank you, Minister. And just when we are talking about the issues in relation to the protocol, etc., can you also give me an update on the regulations that are in place at the moment for import, importing pedigree cattle into Northern Ireland? Is there any movement there? Thank the member for that, that question. And again, um, we have a significant problem with the importation of both cattle and sheep. And as a consequence of that, um, there is a large number of black-faced sheep in particular, not exclusively, but black-faced sheep in particular, uh, which are currently in Scotland. They have been bought in September, and the farmers cannot get them home. And the EU have been very rigid about this thus far, in spite of um, our, our requests. And I think that we need to get some flexibility as farmers and 
the Antrim Hills and the Sperrins and, 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 and the Moorns and so forth, um, who have invested heavily uh, and are not getting the, those animals brought home. Uh, as well as that, the pedigree industry has been badly affected uh, because they previously were taking uh, bulls and heifers to, to Scotland uh, and indeed to the north of England uh, for some of the large sales there. Uh, because of the six-month standstill, they are not prepared to take that risk um, because if they do not sell the animals, um, then how are they going to ensure those animals' welfare um, on another farm in Scotland or England um, in terms of how those animals have been treated? Because they are high-value animals. And this is devastating for the pedigree industry in Northern Ireland if this issue is not resolved. And it is a ludicrous issue in terms of uh, securing the single market. It has no impact whatsoever on the single market. And the European Union really need to back down on this and, and wise up and treat Northern Ireland with a degree of respect. I now call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware that climate change is an issue which uh, concerns us all. Uh, can the Minister outline uh, what independent scientific advice he has received um, within the Department uh, in terms of formulating the proposed climate change bill? Well, as I indicated to Ms Dolan, um, we have been taking advice off the Climate Change Committee, uh, which is a panel of experts and um, they are independent experts. And <clears throat> I recently received a, a letter from the Chair of that committee and it indicated that our analysis has not produced a scenario for UK net zero in 2050 that sees Northern Ireland reach net zero in the same year. We are not therefore able precisely to calculate the costs of Northern Ireland reaching net zero, but they will almost certainly be higher than those of the 82 per cent reduction target by up to £900 million a year by 2050. If an engineered removals technologies are used, um, the context of a net zero target, uh, 2050 target for the whole of the UK, um, is also important, and that is what we need to focus on as one country moving forward with a net zero target, and that is wholly achievable. And Northern Ireland can play a very significant contribution in that. I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for that response? Uh, the Minister has set out that his bill would set targets to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 82 per cent by 2050. Uh, others have suggested net zero by 2045. Uh, what impact would this have on Northern Ireland, and is it a realistic target? Well, uh, I believe the member to my right, um, Mr. Aiken, actually thinks we can do it by 2035. Um, however, I'm not sure where his expertise comes from. Um, but the climate change experts are saying a larger reduction in output um, from the Northern Ireland livestock sector would be required, and compared to the rest of the UK. And even our most stretching tailwind scenario, which entails a 50 per cent fall in meat and dairy production in Northern Ireland by 2050, and significant, significantly greater levels of tree planting on the land released, is not enough to get Northern Ireland to net zero emissions in 2050. Without a corresponding reduction in the consumption of such produce, this would simply shift emissions overseas. So I, I, I want to listen to climate change experts, and I suspect that there are a lot of climate change experts in this chamber who I'd be slightly less inclined to listen to. Um, I prefer to listen to the Climate Change Committee, who have some uh, expertise and background in, this, in these matters. And I think we do well not to destroy the Northern Ireland economy, not to be putting 50,000 people, because there are 100,000 people involved in agri-food, not to be putting 50,000 families uh, into the unemployment region uh, because we want to grab a headline. I call Kiva Archibald. Last can call you, and I suppose following on from the previous question, can I ask the Minister what work his department is doing in terms of scientific work uh, to recognise the importance of carbon sequestration in our soils, hedgerows, trees, etc.? Well, that, is, that is a course of work that I want to engage very closely with this Assembly on. We have significant opportunities in our peatlands for carbon storage, but that will involve wetting those peatlands, and as a consequence of wetting those peatlands, the farms that are closest to it will probably lose and most, most likely lose um, a, a ability to graze those lands, uh, certainly for uh, a, as long a period as currently the case. And therefore, those farms need, need to be adequately compensated, and therefore the, the opportunities to you know, 
tap into the, the, a new um, single foreign payment scheme, uh, which we are not restricted to by the European Union, and gives us that opportunity to do that. I also want to look at the opportunities of having more structured management of our hedgerows, because the hedgerows are, are um, superb, captures, uh, superb capturers of carbon. And, uh, well, we, we bring that into the, the single foreign payment scheme that farms have a, a, a structured plan um, for their hedgerows um, that will enable them to uh, and encourage them to actually grow those hedgerows for longer periods of time. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest assets we have is our hedgerows, and if we could grow them a metre higher or a metre wider, um, they will capture massive amounts of carbon. So we can work through a lot of this together without inflicting the massive pain that I referred to in, to, the, to the previous member, and I think that is what must be done here. We must identify the means that we can of ensuring that our carbon footprint is reduced, but not destroy our farms in the process by doing illogical things. I call Kiva Archibald for something. Um, good morning. Good last call, can call you. And I thank the Minister for that response, and I'm sure the Minister would agree that we, you know, we need to be ambitious in terms of what we're doing in, to reduce our, our carbon footprint, um, and that um, the role of carbon sequestration and an understanding of that is really important to the public discourse around all of this in terms of recognising the service that farmers also do to, um, to support the environment, and in terms of also ensuring that there is adequate knowledge transfer. Um, Could the come to a question? and encourage uh, farmers to do these types of, of schemes on their land and, as you refer to yourself, rewarding them appropriately. Yeah. And I think that farmers recognise that they have a contribution to make and they are engaging very positively in making that contribution and it is for this Assembly to engage positively with them. And therefore, you know, I think that the Assembly would be much wiser uh, to follow the path that I am recommending in, ter in terms of the climate change legislation, because that will work with the farming community. And let me say this: um, at least 82% is at least. It could be it could be significantly more than that if that is achievable. And as the science develops, um, and as we identify, for example, um, what carbon capture actually exists in, in, in our grasslands, and how. Um, that's, that can be greater even in hill areas because more of that grassland gets trumped um, and therefore the grass goes back into the soil and that, that grass has captured carbon from the atmosphere in the first place, um, uh, th then um, we, can, we can perhaps move forward with, with something more significant. But we need to give ourselves a degree of latitude as opposed to enforcing uh, uh, some fixed thing uh, which, which does not give us that latitude and inevitably causes massive harm. Um, to our farm families, takes away their livelihoods, takes away the jobs and the industries that are associated with it. That is a hugely unacceptable position for me as, as the dear Minister uh, and as the, 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 this Assembly's uh, spokesperson um, for that sector. I call Thomas Buchanan. Hey, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister if he could give us an update on the future food strategy uh, framework? Um, yes, we, we have uh, done considerable work on that, and uh, we are at the point of making a, an appointment um, to take that forward, um, along with the DFE minister. And uh, that is something which uh, is being progressed and will be announced um, next week, given uh, what, what, what the, the, the sad death of the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, we don't propose to announce this week. I call Tom McCann for supplement. Yeah, can I uh, thank the Minister for his response? And perhaps the Minister can uh, give us some indication as to what thought or role perhaps the government departments can play in supporting Northern Ireland food producers? Well, uh, we, we want to see, and, and our department is very clear, it wants to see Northern Ireland at its best, and many of our farmers are, are at their best um, and uh, achieving really great things, our world leaders. Um, some others are, are, are somewhat behind. Um, so good quality benchmarking, identifying what is achievable, encouraging people to, to be progressive um, in their agricultural practice. Um, all of those things uh, are, are very, very important. How we can actually use the, the, the whole climate change uh, 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 agenda uh, uh, to actually uh, develop new interests on our farms. So can we um, 
take the excess of farm nutrients and develop those into something which is sellable to other parts of the world which actually lack those nutrients. So we have a surplus, they have a, a deficit. You know, can we invest in, in, in capturing uh, those materials in a way which enables us to, to actually sell that as a product uh, and have a win-win for both the environment and indeed for the agri-food sector? And that is the end of our period of time for questions to the Minister. I would ask members, members to take their ease for a few minutes uh, until our next period of questions, uh, questions to the Minister for Communities.